Dear viewers, hopefully all of you are doing very well. I am Dr. Sharad Khandakar and today I will talk about the Working Capital Management Lecture. So before going to the topic, let's look at the learning objectives. So the learning objective includes number one, define working capital management, cash cycle and operating cycles. Two, Compute the cost of trade, credit, and compare that cost to alternative sources of financing. Third, discuss ways that the companies provide trade credit to their customers. And the last step uh, involves in establishing a credit policy and discuss the importance of monitoring accounts payable, inventory management, and cash. So, Let's go to the lecture. So what is the working capital management? As we know, most projects require the firm to invest in the networking capital. The main components of networking capital are cash, inventory, receivables, and the payables. Now when we look into the, the working capital management, as we know, the working capital is the required amount of money which the business need for the day-to-day -day operation and they need to have a clear budget of how much working capital they require for the day-to-day -day operation so when we look to the working capital management we need to understand few things one is the cash cycle so the cash cycle is the length of time between when the firm pays cash to purchase its initial inventory and when it receives cash from sale of output product from that inventory. So it is basically when it pays the money for its purchase and when it receives money from its sales. So that is the cash cycle. In this slide, it shows some of the measures of the cash cycles and what are the ways we can calculate the cash conversion cycle, inventory days, account receivable days, and account payable days. So cash conversion cycle includes inventory day plus account receivable days minus account payable days. So how do we calculate the inventory days? So the inventory days include inventory divided by the average cost of goods sold. Account receivable days includes account receivables divided by the average daily sales and the account payable this can be computed by account payable divided by the average daily cost of goods sold. These are the formula which is important for us to understand or to do the calculation for this chapter. So what is the operating cycle? Now before we understand what is for the cash cycle. Now the operating cycle is the average length of time between when a firm's originally purchase its inventory and when it receives cash from selling its product. Most firms buy their inventory on credit, which reduces the amount of time between the cash investment and the receipt from cash from the investment. So if you look into this slide, it explains the operating cycle the cash cycle, inventory, account receivable, and account payable. If you look at it here, here the funds buy the inventory, that's the first process, then funds pays the inventory. Third, firm sells the product, and then firm receive payment for their sales. As we know, when five bonds, as we know, when firms buy the inventory, they generally buy the inventory on credit. So there is a gap between when the firm purchased the inventory and it pays for the inventory. When they finish the product, they sell the product to the supplier. Sorry, they sell the product to the customer. And when they sell the product, they generally sell the product on credit and after a few days the firm receives the payment. 
So from here, we can calculate the inventory days. So the inventory date is from purchased inventory from and the firm sells the product. And so that is the inventory days. Account receivable days is basically when the firm sells the product and when the firm receives the payment for the product. Account payable day is when the firm buys the inventory and when it sells the inventory. Sorry, when it pays uh, for the inventory. So this is the time is called account payable days. And uh, the cash cycle is when the firm pays for the inventory and when the firm receives the payment for their sales. So that is the cash cycle. And the overall cycle, it is basically called the operating cycle. You need to have a very clear understanding about the cash cycle, the operating cycle, inventory days, account receivable days, and account payable days in order to do the calculations. So this particular slide is very important for you. Now in this slide, it shows the working capital in various industries. You will find some of the large industries in the world, for example, PepsiCo, Amazon, the account receivable days for the PepsiCo is 40 days, where for Amazon the account receivable days is 7 days. Inventory days for PepsiCo is 46 days, for Amazon is 34 days. Account payable days for PepsiCo is 135 days, where Amazon is 62 days. And if you look into the cash conversion cycle, which is CCC or the triple C, is for PepsiCo is minus 49 days and for Amazon is minus 21 days. Why? because a good manager will always try to stretch the account payable and would like to re reduce the number of days in account receivable. And that's how uh, the cash conversion cycle could be reduced. And a good company always would like to uh, stretch the account payable and reduce the days in account receivable. Now this is all the desirable and therefore you will find the large industry in the world uh, they would like to reduce the cash conversion cycle. This is one of uh, the effective measure to uh, effectively run the networking capital for any industry. So let's look at an example. So in this example we look the firm value and working capital. Jackson Enterprises is considering a new project that will cost $10 million. The project will require an investment to date of $1,500,000 for the networking capital. The firm will recover the investment in networking capital when the project ends in 10 years. The discount rate for this type of cash flow is 5.6% per year. What is the present value of the cost? of working capital for this project. So in this project, we are basically calculating the present value of the net working capital. Now this is very easy for you, so you can easily calculate it. Solution. So the investment in working capital result in cash flows today is $1.5 million and the cash inflow is $1.5 million in 10 years. So what it say that because we need to invest today $1.5 million, today in the networking capital and this money will be recovered after 10 years. So the NPV as we know NPV is we need to calculate what is the cash inflow for the project in today's dollar term and that today's dollar term this money will be receiving in our future dollar so we need to calculate in present dollar terms minus the initial outlay. So as we know the project will generate $1.5 million after 10 years and the market rate of return is 5.6%. So $1.5 million divided by 1 plus 0 0.056 power 10. 10 is the T. T is in 10 years. And 0 0.056 is basically the market rate of return uh, in decimal places. So this is the present value of uh, the future cash inflow. 
for the phone and negative 1.5 million dollar this is basically today's investment so if you calculate it you'll find that the, the total value is negative 63135 so, so the trade credit is when the firm sells its product to its customer on credit so the credit that the firm extends to its customer and generally you'll find when the trade credit is given to each customer there are certain information or there are certain uh, criteria we need to understand one is called the net 30 for example uh, or say 2 by 10 or net 30 so what are these conditions so net 30 is for example saying the payment is not due until the 30th day from the date of invoice so you purchase the product today the money is not due until the next 30th day so you can pay on 30th day from 1 to 30th day it's not due in this time uh, and if you pay the money within this uh, period you will not charge any extra uh, amount or you don't have any interest for paying on late so the number of days may vary depending upon the company for example it could be say net 15 or it could be net 60. sometimes it can also mention the 2 by 10 or net 30 so if the bar pays within 10 days they will receive 2 percent discount otherwise the full amount is due in 30 days so whatever the purchase amount you know if the amount paid within first 10 days they receive or, uh, or or the buyers will receive a 2% discount on the invoiced amount and let's say it's net 30 so from days 11 till day 30 if the payment is made so the no extra amount will be charged but the customer will not get any discount so note the discount and the number of days may vary such as uh, 1 by 10 so, th so the customer will receive 1% discount if the payment is made on 10 days or net 20 say so the amount should be paid within 20 days or 2 by 10 or net 45 so assume a firm says a product for $100 and offer its customer a term of 2 by 10 and net 30 the customer doesn't have to pay anything for the first 10 days so the effectively has a zero interest loan for the period because the customers are not paying anything for first 10 days so it is like a zero interest loan if the customer takes advantages of the discount and pays within 10 days 10 day discount period the customer pays only $98 for the product so if the customer pay within the 10 day they will receive 2% discount so the customer is eventually paying $98 not $100 so when we look into the effective annual rate for the trade credit you can find that it is fascinating sometimes because though we are saying that it's getting 2% discount but actually the effective interest rate could be much higher than that so let's look at scenario rather than pay within 10 days the customer has the option to use $98 for an additional 20 days the interest rate for the 20 days term of the loan is 2 divided by 98 so 2.04 percent so that's the interest rate for that uh, with a 365 days in a year so as we know there's 365 days in a year this rate over 20 days corresponds to the effective annual rate of uh, 44.6 percent so how do we calculate it so first of all what we do that because if the customer pay within 10 days they will, they will receive 2 percent discount uh, but the 2 percent is not on 100 dollars but so there is a 2 dollar discount on 98 dollars because they're paying only 98 dollars so if you do the calculation you'll find the interest rate is 2.04 now it is uh, only for basically 20 days they receive this discount so if 
we compare it or if, it con if you convert it on the annual rate, it is much higher than that. Let's remember that when we calculate the interest rate or interest is on annual term. So the effective annual rate should be 1.0204. Now 0204 is coming from here. That's the interest rate. Close the bracket. Power 365 because 365 days in a year divided by 20. Because for the 20 days we get we get extra 2% discount. So this is divided by that minus 1. So we will get the effective annual rate 44.6%. So this is a very high interest rate. So it is always advisable to take a trade credit if it is a good option. So let's look at an alternative example. Your firm purchases goods from its supplier on terms of 2 by 10 or net 45. What is the effective annual cost to your firm if it choose not to take advantages of the trade discount offered? So if you do the solution, it's 2 by 10. So it is basically like the previous example uh, like that 2 divided by 98 the 2 by 10 is exactly the same and the net is 45 so 45 is basically 35 so if you solve it you'll find is that the effective annual cost is 23.45 days so what are the benefits of the trade credit the trade credit is simple and convenient to use and it therefore has lower transaction cost than the alternative sources of fund. So this is the best and biggest example. It is flexible source of fund and can be used as needed. And it is sometimes only sources of funding available to a firm. So when we're talking about uh, small types of industry, so sometimes the trade credit could be the only source for them. For the large organization, they can go to the money market and they can borrow the money. But for the medium size or to small size of institution, it might be the only sources of fund. So trade credit versus the standard loan. So why of a trade credit? Providing finance at the below market rate is an indicated indicate way to lower price for only certain customers. For example, automobile manufacturer often offer low cost financing, but only for the most qualified buyers. Second, because the supplier may have an ongoing business relationship with this customer. It may have more information about the credit quality of the customer than a bank. So they might like to offer the trade credit. And third is if the buyer default, the supplier may be able to seize the inventory as a collateral. So this slide discusses about the managing float. So what, are, what is the collection float? So the amount of time it takes for a firm to be able to use fund after the customer has paid for its goods. So if the customer pays for its goods, so how long it takes a firm to be able to use the fund after it has been paid? It, it consists of the mail float processing float and availability float. So what is the mail float? The mail float is how long it takes a firm to receive a customer's payment check after the customer has mailed it. So when the customer mails the check, how long it takes the firm to receive the customer's payment to its bank account. Processing float is how long it takes the firm to process a customer's payment check and deposit uh, it to the bank. So that's called the processing float and availability float is how long it takes a bank to give firm credit for customer payment the firm has deposited to the bank. So all these three floats, the mail float, processing float and availability float is also important for a firm because it sometimes it takes some significant amount of time to receive the money after the, after the sale has been made. This slide We'll discuss about the receivable management and the first thing is we need to determine the credit policy. When we'll determine the credit policy, we need to look for the three steps. The first step is establishing credit standard. So in here, we need to determine who will qualify for the credit. Second, establishing the credit terms. Here we need to determine the net period and if a discount will be offered. 
and the third step is establishing a collection policy. So here we need to determine the course of action to take if the customer does not pay as agreed. So this slide will talk about the account receivable days. So the account receivable days is the average number of days that it has taken a firm to collect uh, on itself. So a firm can com uh, compare the account receivable days to the credit terms. For example, if the credit terms specify the net is 30 and the account receivable days are standing for 45 days, the firm can conclude that its customers are paying uh, 15 days late on average. So it is absolutely important for uh, any organization to determine its account receivable days policy. So a firm can look at the trend in account receivable days by looking to the agent schedule. So the agent schedule is we need to determine uh, the percentage and the amount of account receivable day which is falling outside our account uh, receivable policy or the collection policy. So let's look at an example. So this chart shows uh, this chart shows you uh, the aging schedule, for example. So let's look into the problem first and then uh, we look to the solution. FTS or the financial trading system bills its customer on terms of 3 by 10 and net 30. The firm's account receivable includes 100,000 that has been outstanding for 10 days or fewer days, 300,000 outstanding for 11 to 30 days, 100,000 outstanding for 31 to 40 days, 20,000 outstanding for 41 to 50 days, and 10,000 outstanding for 51 to 60 days, and 2,000 outstanding for more than 60 days. Prepare an aging schedule for FTS. So the number has been given, so the amount which has been outstanding for the number of days. So we need to create uh, an aging schedule. So first of all, in the left hand side, this is the days outstanding. So, so 1 to 10 days, 11 to 30 days, uh, 31 to 40 days, 41 to 50 days, 51 to 60 days, and the 60 days plus. Now, this days outstanding, we have been taking it from here. Second is the amount outstanding. So how much amount has been outstanding for how many days? And then the percentage outstanding. So one to 10 days is $100,000. As if you look right here, the firm receives this, uh, the, firm, the firm's account receivable includes 100,000 that has been outstanding for one to 10 days. So one to 10 days, $100,000. So uh, and for 11 to 30 days, it's $300,000. So if you look at it in here, it shows that 300,000 outstanding for 11 to 30 days. So if you add all the outstanding amount, then add all the amounts together, and then it's find that the total value of the outstanding amount is $532,000. And then you try to calculate what is the percentage of outstanding. Remember that the percentage should be 100%. Now this is how we create an aging schedule. Now, why is important? You can find that the FTS or the financial trading system builds its account on terms of three by 10 on net 30. But if you look into the net 30, so Basically, the firm has a large amount uh, of money outstanding after the 30 days. Okay, so this is why it's important. It's around, uh, you know, uh, it's, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, 23 to 4%, which is outstanding more than 30 days. So let's look at an alternative example. Multi corporation bills its account on terms of 2 by 10 and net 30. The firm account receivable are collected as follows. So days outstanding, 1 by 10, 11 by 30, 
31 by 40, 41 by 50, 51 by 60 and 60 plus and the percentage outstanding has been given. The company currently has $780,000 in account outstanding. If Marley's average daily cash sale is $22,000, so what is the company's account receivable days? That's what we need to calculate. Prepare an account receivable aging table for the company. That's what we also need to calculate. Is the account receivable days a true representation of the account receivable uh, collection experience? So that's what we need to uh, comment on that. So as we uh, know the term, we know the debt outstanding, we know the percentage outstanding, and the company has currently $780,000 on account receivable, and we know the daily credit sale is $22,000. So let's look at the solution. So from the debt outstanding and from the amount outstanding, we can easily calculate the percentage uh, from the percentage we can easily calculate the amount outstanding for example 1 to 10 days uh, percentage outstanding was 20.4 so 20.4 on 780 is basically 159120 dollars the same way from 11 days to 30 days the percentage outstanding in the previous slide shows that 48.9% so it's exactly in here, same in here, 48.9%. So 48.9% on $780,000 is $381,420. So this way you calculate the amount outstanding. Okay. Then we need to calculate what's called the account ACP. So we're account collection period. Uh, so we, as we know that the current account receivable balance is 780 and the average delicate sale is $22,000 so it is actually 35.45 days okay now as we know it's given in the question that the company's term is 2 by 10 and it's 30 okay and then the question asks that if the account receivable days is true representation of the account receivable collection uh, experience. So what is your answer? So, really, so the collection experience showing that it is actually taking 35.45 days, but the, it's the company's net uh, is 30 days. Even if you look at it here, a large percentage of money is being collected after the 30 days. Okay, so what is the solution? So the company's account receivable day is 35.45 days as the calculated compact is 30 days. From this, we can conclude that the company is taking too long to collect. This assessment is borne out by the aging schedule, which reflects the fact that 30.7% of the company's sales are collected on the late so 30.7 percent so if you calculate here it is 30.7 percent are collecting on late so the company is not managing its account receivable appropriately payable management so the firm should borrow using account payable only if trade credit is the list uh, expenses source of funding so the cost of trade credit depends on the trade credit terms for example, the higher the discount percentage offer, the greater the cost of foregoing the discount. So if the higher percentage of discount offer must, you know, we should go for the discount because the opportunity cost of foregoing the discount is very, very high. Uh, the shorter the loan period, the greater the cost of the foregoing the discount. So if the loan period is shorter, so the greater the cost of the foregoing the discount as well. So we need to uh, make sure that we, you know, we, uh, we calculate uh, different terms and also the other sources and if it is the only best option then we should go for it. Example the payable management. So let's look an example in here. The problem is, so th this problem has been taken from your textbook. So road company 
has an average account payable balance of $250,000. Its average daily cost of goods sold is $14,000. And it receives terms 2 by 15 and net 40 from its supplier. Road chooses to forego the, forego the discount. Is the firm managing its account payable well? So the solution, the firm is not managing its account payable well. Road's account payable day outstanding is 250 divided by the 14,000 is 17.9 days. If Road made the payment three days earlier, it could take advantages of 2% discount. So as the credit term suggests that if it pays within 15 days, it will receive 2% discount. But when you calculate the account payable days, we can find that actually they are using uh, the uh, uh, they are actually paying on 17.9 days. If they effectively manage the account payable, if they can pay within 15 days, they can get actually 2% discount. So if for some reason you choose to forego the discount, you should not be paying the full amount until the, the 40th day. So as they're paying on about 17 days, but they can receive discount if they pay within 15 days, that, so they should target for that. Because that should be the effective way of managing the account payable. However, for some reason, if the company cannot pay within the 15 days, then why they should pay on 17 days? So they should stretch it longer, so pay on 40th, uh, the 40th day, so the last day of uh, uh, last day of the payable day, not the seventeenth day. So in this situation, we can see that the company is not managing its account payable uh, effectively. Stretching account payable is good, as we have seen in our previous slide, uh, that a large number of companies, a large number of big companies, for example, the PepsiCo, Amazon, they stretch their account payable. And they use the cash or they use the fund of other company to do their business. So, however, we need to understand or we need to consider a few other things as well. So, when a firm ignores a payment due period and pays later, for example, given that the net term is 30 days, a firm pays maybe on 45 days. Or given that 2 by 10 days and net term is 30 days, the firm may pay on 12 days and still take 2% discount. So for example, in our previous example, what we have seen, that the companies, uh, the term suggests that if they pay within 15 days, they can still, uh, they can get 2% discount. So in here, if they pay within 15 days, the, uh, the company will get 2% discount. But as we are paying 17.9 days, you know, we can negotiate with the company that, okay, We'll pay on 17 days, but can we still get the discount? So the negotiable uh, uh, opportunity is always there. So the firm should negotiate about the opportunity of paying 17 days, but still get the 2% discount. However, the supplier may react to a firm whose payment are always late by imposing late fees or terms of cash delivery or the cash before the delivery so there could be some situation that the firm who always pays on late that you know the supplier may impose some restrictions but if you do the negotiation before to stretch your account payable and do the negotiation before saying that okay this is the reason we need extra two days there's nothing harm and every company should go for that So, so what is the benefit of holding the inventory? One, it is basically preventing the stock out and seasonality in demand. Now, we are talking about the supply, we are talking about the inventory, so what are the benefits of it? However, when we talk about the inventory management, there are some benefits to holding the inventory, but the same way there are costs of holding the inventory as well. For example, there could be an acquisition cost, there could be an order cost carrying cost. So we always need to minimize the cost. So 
because the inventory cost a lot of money, the holding inventory costs a lot of money for us. So there is a new system, it's called the just-in-time inventory management. So the just-in-time inventory management is when a firm acquires inventory uh, precisely when it's needed so that the inventory balance is always zero or very close to zero. So the only order for an inventory when they really need it. So they do not want to hold the inventory for a long time because it costs money. So the just-in-time inventory management uh, often use reducing the carrying cost as much as possible. For example, Toys R Us. Now, Toys R Us in Australia, they use just-in-time inventory management and they reduce their carrying costs significantly. All right, so we are almost the end of our lecture today. So in the last slide is talking, is discussed about the cash management. So is the level of cash relevant? Is there any optimal uh, liquidity level of the firm? Now, as we know, there are different ways uh, or different motives of holding the cash for a firm. Uh, it could be because of the transaction balance, the amount of cash the firm needs to be able to pay for its bills. So that's called the transaction balance. Another motivation for holding the cash is precautionary balance because the future we are not very certain. So there are uncertainty always in the future. So precautionary, precautionary balance uh, should be there uh, as a motivation of holding the cash and compensating balance. So sometimes the bank might ask the firm to maintain a minimum uh, amount all the time in order to give them the service. So these are the motivation motivation for holding the cash for the firm. However, if there's an optimal level, it's very difficult to say because it's depending upon the firms, it's depending upon the activity and the nature of the business. Hopefully you liked the lecture today and thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, do not forget to uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to see more videos on finance. Thank you.